Rules and Law and Order. My name is John West and I'm the conference organiser. Now why are we holding a conference on law and order? Well the answer is simple. We are losing the war on crime. Britain is now a country plagued by crime. We have the highest rates of violent crime in Europe. Every week children are being knifed to death on our streets. Indeed violent crime has risen 85%. Sex offences have doubled since 1997 and 130 crimes are now committed in Britain every single year. Criminal gangs roam our streets. 60% of prisoners offend within, re offend within two years. And the Home Office has released 71 murderers to kill again. The government's failure to combat crime is costing you, the British taxpayer, £60 billion a year. So, so much for Labour's promise to be tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. And don't rely on the Tories to deal with it either. Remember David Cameron's advice to hug a hoodie? So much for the Law and Order Party. Now, the UK Independence Party believes in a new approach to crime because we are the real Law and Order Party now. Now, during this conference, you will hear about our radical new policies on crime. Policies that will make Britain a safer place in which to live. Because we believe in putting the rights of the victim before that of the criminal. To put it simply, we believe in reclaiming the streets for you, the law-abiding citizen. And now I'd like to introduce Chris Hudson, who will read out a special message from Bob Spink, UKIP's first Member of Parliament. Thank, thank you very much indeed, John, and uh, the first thing I want to do is to say uh, a great thank you to John, Alison, Ray, who's helping out with the sound. That will come later, but I just wanted to say thank you for putting this on. It isn't a, it isn't a question so much of how many people attend or don't attend, it's the fact that the message gets out there. Here in this room and on the web, and more particularly at home and in the streets because we are facing a chance over the next year where our message must become clear to all the voters and it's very important. So I wanted to congratulate John, Alison, Ray and all the rest of the people and thank you so much for those who came along today. So thank you, John. <clears throat> I'm, I'm very privileged to be able to read out to you a message from Dr. Bob Spink, who is our new UKIP MP, and I stress UKIP MP, in the House of Commons. For those of you who don't know, he is the member for Castle Point and uh, made that strong and right decision to join UKIP within the last two months. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great privilege to address you today, albeit remotely from Westminster, where I have the pleasure to represent the millions of people in Britain who support our sound UKIP policies. As more and more prisoners are released early because of jail overcrowding, more and more teenagers are tragically injured and murdered on our streets. Is it any wonder that the fear of crime has risen to epidemic levels under successive soft labor and conservative governments? The criminal justice system is now a complete basket case. It's failing the public and it's also binding youngsters into a life of crime. 90% of young offenders re-offend within two years. The system is part of the problem and not part of the solution. And politically correct politicians are to blame. Parts of Britain are becoming totally lawless. And the government's response is to tell judges to cut custodial sentences to cut 
custodial sentences. When will they ever learn that banged up villains don't do crime? The solution of overcrowding is solved not by letting people out early, but by building more prisons and seriously increasing deterrence. That make, means making prisons places villains want to avoid, not stay inside. We need to punish, rehabilitate and reform offenders. Something that cannot be done in overcrowded prisons or with soft community services. Soft on crime labor and the politically correct Tories have failed the people of Britain. The Human Rights Act is a charter for allowing criminals to avoid serving their sentences. And that is why it is UKIP's policy to repeal it Another popular sound UKIP policy, working closely with the superb and united UKIP team, I've set out several such policies on domestic issues in the House of Commons in recent, and there are many more to come over the weeks and months that lie ahead. UKIP policy is that only first time non-violent offenders get early release and only then when they have served at least 75% of their time. Thank you for coming today and thank you for supporting our party. Yours faithfully, Bob Spink MP, proud to be your UKIP representative in Westminster.
It's needless. It's pointless. It's intrusive. And it's wholly un-British. And in any case, don't we have ID anyway? I mean, if, if I asked you right now, if you could show me photographic ID, could you do it? You probably could. You don't need an ID card. There you go. Driving license. Hopefully that's good enough. And somewhere, license to sell alcohol. It's both issued by government departments, but apparently we need ID cards. Ludicrous, especially the British take on it, which is just intrusive. And they also need to go. Of course, our policy is we'll scrap any plans to introduce this kind of intrusive identity scheme. Now on to unimaginative policies of every political party. Every election time, every party rolls out those same kind of policies we always hear. And I'm talking specifically for law and order here. And the most popular, we will, and I'm quoting from any party, you can choose which one, uh, we will increase police numbers, uh, scrap red tape, um, police bureaucracy, you know, you know, it's just, you know, same old, same old, isn't it? But, you know, let me give you one example where we can make a real difference. Because there's legislative, uh, there's legislative uh, problems that are introduced to the police service by law. The Criminal Procedure and Investigations Act 1996, I'll call it CPI Act because it's just too much of a mouthful. I remember I was sitting in Surrey Police Lecture Theatre in 97, listening to a presentation on it and, and to how it was going to affect day-to-day -day policing. And the trainer up there tried to tell us that it would save time. What a load of rot. It's really quite ridiculous. So let me take you through a simplistic incident and what that act means. Because the, the way we can streamline things and make it a lot easier for officers on a day-to-day -day basis is by scrapping things like the CPI Act because it just ties officers to the desks. So, police officer goes to an incident. First of all, uh, probably going to be travelling at some speed, so he'll hear an incident over the radio and just make some scrawled note on the passenger seat if he's working solo. Uh, the time, location, fight. Very basic, but just so he knows what, came, what time it came in and where he's going. Or she, should I be politically correct? So first of all, we've got the, the note that's on his pad on the passenger seat. He gets to the incident. He'll then make a note, something like that, a pocket notebook. Then need to start taking a statement on something like that, and probably that, and then that. And um, God forbid, would you be able to use a computer? You have to handwrite it. That's just three examples so far, but the paperwork, you just wouldn't believe. Now, the CPI Act, and what does that have to do with all of these various bits of paper that so far this incident has amassed? Well, when it comes to compiling the court file, the CPI Act places certain responsibilities on investigating officers. Now, an investigating officer isn't some plainclothes detective. An investigating officer is any police officer investigating any offence. And you have to fill in another set of forms justifying what you're going to do with each of these pieces of paper that we have so far got through this incident. So first of all, you've got the piece of paper which uh, the officer scrawled down in the car, and that says the time and the location and what the incident is. You've got that piece of paper. Then you've got the pocket notebook, and then you've got the statement. And what you have to do is you have to justify whether you're going to disclose that item to the defence or not. And you have to sit there, off the streets, of course, in the police station, well out of sight of the public, justifying what you're going to do with each of these pieces of paper. So, the first one. The notes that I scrawled in the car, am I going to disclose this to the defence? Yeah, okay. So, disclose that to the defence. Pocket notebook. 
Well, in there, you've got the victim's name and address. You don't fancy the suspect going around and knocking on the victim's door, so you don't want the defence to have a copy of that. But in fact, what you have to do is create another copy of this. So you have to photocopy your pocket notebook, and then you have to blot out the part with the victim's name. So now you have two copies of your pocket notebook. So you say that one you're going to disclose to the defence, and one you're not going to disclose to the defence. Ah, oh, but the form asks you another question. Why aren't you going to disclose this one to the defence? I don't think I need to go on. This is just one piece of legislation that is suffocating our police officers. You know, this is what I was doing. This is what takes you off the streets. And this is what you don't hear about. This is how legislation is strangling our police officers on a day-to-day -day basis. And you know what? You know, all, all this figuring out, are you going to disclose it to the defence? Are you not going to disclose it to the defence? Oh, please. Can I arrest a criminal? And all of a sudden, what we actually find is that we are, I would say, employing some pretty skilled people to be overpaid administrators. When really, they definitely should be out there catching criminals. And it's not even their fault. The government rolls in legislation such as I've described, and they just have to abide by it. And you've heard the, the demonstration. It's just ludicrous. That is why, when I took a look at this policy, I was very pleased with what it included. For me, it was a do-or-die moment. With 10 years' experience in the police service, I wanted to know that the party that I've stood for in elections for the last few years included all the things that I wanted to see in a law and order policy. And the fact is, this touches all the bases. Scrap the Human Rights Act. Stop the police being strangled with red tape. It's absolutely unnecessary. And most of all, you know, maybe, just maybe, once we've done everything that we promise in this document, we might be lucky enough to see a few more of these on our streets. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Rob. Are there any questions from the floor that people would like to, uh, to ask of Rob? I'll, I, we've just got a chap coming down uh, with a roving mi microphone. Ray will be coming round. Um, splendid. Que there's a question at the b uh, back of the room. Perhaps you'd be kind enough, sir, to uh, give us your name if convenient. Thank you. Mr. Alamo. I never got up when I was in the Second World War in Ireland. Then, I wasn't quite clear. You're not opposed to identity cards, I take it? You're not opposed to identity cards? Are you not actually opposed to them? No, I, I, am, I am opposed to what they, they are proposing, which is well, chips and it's, it's well, un it's un unnecessary. I, I entirely agree with you. We had them here in the war, everybody, as you described it. Perfectly simple. We didn't want all this. Yeah, if you just name the rest of the photograph, all you need. And if your son's in trouble with some undesirables, you can track him, but you never find him. Yeah, absolutely agree. My, my view on this is that um, we have the driving licenses. They've introduced more anti fraud um, measures with the driving licenses. If, if you've uh, been reissued one recently, you'll find your uh, last name is now raised to prevent people uh, copying them. Yeah. Regarding paperwork for the police, of course, the police have to be a witness. They are a witness to a crime. You very often, actually, very often. So they have to do some recording of the truth, don't they? That's so correct. We can't wipe it out all together. Sixty years ago, to be honest, we were agitating for the same thing. Get rid of the paper up along the street. And nothing really happened. So it's got to be somewhere between the two. But we're so muddled now. Do you know, when I was in the war, I think back and I think, do you know, I'd rather be underneath a, a rain of German bombs than the state this country is in now. So let's hope we can get the hell out of Europe and get rid of all this rubbish. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question at the front. Thanks, Ray. Uh, thank you. I'm 
then Barry's chair of uh, UK Fenland. In your estimation, what is the Police Federation and the normal Bobby on the Beach attitude to the return of tackle punishment and, if and when necessary, call for punishment? Because I myself am one of the Hannam and Flubbin Brigade, I'm afraid. I lived through the Second World War, as did the gentleman before me. When I got in trouble at school, I got a rat over the knuckles with the ruler. I didn't turn into a dog no. or a hoodie. No. And neither did the vast majority of people in this country these days. Right. Unfortunately, we are in the hands of the do-gooders, the people who want to, as David Cameron said, hug a hoodie. Hug him and smother cake him. <laughs> Thank you. I will mention something on that actually. Um, the, I know for sure with um, regards to sentencing generally, whether it's a permanent termination or not, um, the general feeling within the police service is one of uh, generally just more, uh, just, just stiffer sentences. When you go through um, the paperwork that I mentioned, you're hoping that the response in the end will be one that uh, you get a result not only for your hard work, but also for the victim. And it's not only the victim that feels disappointed at court, because as a police officer, you kind of wonder why you're bothered, to be quite blunt. Um, you get clever barristers just making these ludicrous claims, uh, and, and real criminals do get off. Um, hey, it's, they call it justice. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you do see people that you know have uh, committed the offence, um, and sometimes you've witnessed it yourself, but uh, as a police officer it seems that sometimes not even your evidence is, is good enough. But to, to answer your point, um, stiffer sentencing um, is, is certainly what generally is wanted across the board, across the board. Um, and you know, I get really frustrated when I uh, read in the newspapers coverage of certain criminal offences that have happened, um, and the, the sanctions of the sentence that has been uh, imposed on them. Uh, is this, you get these referral orders and these, all these different types of orders that basically is just anything to keep them out of jail. Mm. Yeah, you know, and, it's, and it's, that, that really is crazy because um, when there have been some really serious offences, chuck them inside. I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite firm on that, I'm afraid. You know, chuck them inside. And, and it doesn't happen because we have these, um, I don't know the names of them all, but you know, you've got parenting orders, you've got referral orders, and it's just uh, making the judicial system cuddly. Mm. And we really need to firm up on that. Yeah. Mm. Um, David Fraser, um, could I just make an observation, please, on the, the previous uh, uh, contribution about hanging? This is a, a very interesting issue, and uh, it's. Um, one that generally doesn't get aired anymore in, in public, and I think at the very, very least should again be talked about. Personally, I am uncertain about whether we should. The evidence about what has happened since hanging was abolished makes, makes the anti-hanging uh, stance more and more difficult to defend. So my own uh, reticence would be one of on moral grounds only. But I do understand that, uh, that those who think that it should be brought back. We were told in 1960 that uh, at 65, that, that, that the new arrangements that, we would, that were brought in would keep us safe, they hadn't. And I just want to make that observation and finally say that since hanging was abolished, the homicide rate in this country has doubled. And now we can make of that what we wish. It was 7 in 1 million, it is now 14 in 1 million. Thank you. Yeah, I've seen a reason um, why, for example, we as taxpayers should be paying thousands of pounds per year per prisoner um, to make sure that people like Huntley and West have a really nice end to their life with uh, TV guides and satellite TV and maybe your PlayStation chucked in. Uh, I'm sorry, people like that do not deserve that. Well, thanks very much, Rob. Great speech. I'd just like to uh, let you know that Gerard Batten is now in the building. He's our MEP for London. If you just want to stand up, Gerard, and just say hello to everyone.
Thanks for supporting this event. And his wife's here as well. Thank you very much indeed, uh, John. Um, looking, back, looking back further, there is an addendum here to Dr. Bob Spinks, which I think is worth telling you about as well. We would also impose, and this is direct from Dr. Spink, we would also impose a three strikes and you're out policy, which significantly inflates punishment for repeat offenders. We must send a very strong message to the people that criminal behavior will not be tolerated anymore in Britain. And the best deterrent of all is increasing the probability of being caught. So, as Mr. Jubri was saying just before, the best deterrent of all is increasing the probability of being caught. How? To get more police officers out of the station and onto the streets. UKIP is a great supporter of the police. They need more political backing in the very tough job they have to do to keep society safe. UKIP would cut politically driven policing targets and bureaucracy and free the police to do their job. And there's a balance to be found with the new technology in fighting crimes and individual freedom of the individual. The DNA of convicted criminals and details of sex offenders should be held centrally. But DNA is being held for innocent people. And this is what is giving rise to many concerns. The national ID card system will cause more problems than it could ever solve. It will cost a fortune and may not even work with current technologies. Why this government think they could be trusted with our personal details which could see someone's identity fabricated is a complete mystery. How long would it take before they lose the data and it's sold on for criminal use? I welcome people to this country when they have something to offer. I applaud immigrants when they make a contribution that is in this country's interests. But prison overcrowding is not helped by the large number of EU nationals let in without any immigration controls by this government. Over 2,000 are now in our British prisons. For example, a Romanian man was recommended for deportation on release from prison, but he remained in the UK and then led an identity fraud gang, netting £643,000 from the nasty crime which ruined many innocent people's lives, one of the largest such crimes in the totality of British history. It costs £38,000 per year to keep a prisoner locked up, so EU nationals in jail are costing our UK taxpayers over £76 million per year. Once out of the EU political project, UKIP would deport these criminals, freeing up prison places and thereby reducing crime. This is not rocket science, ladies and gentlemen. Please allow me to sum up, says Dr. Spink. Many problems stem from the EU, not least the, the, sorry, the 15 billion EU membership cost. I know that Gerard will show us many more figures on that if, if we ask him later on, but it's totally debatable how much this nightmare costs. Secondly, Dr. Spink says, the loss of thousands of UK jobs the loss of our democracy and supremacy of our parliament, the ability of all MPs to make law and help people is failing month on month and year on year. These laws have destroyed our fishing industry and fish stocks. 
If you look at the booklet over there, that will help us that we've talked about earlier, that Ray's just holding up now. The uncontrolled immigration putting pressure on housing and public services, and as I explained, our prisons. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been failed totally by successive conservative and labor governments, which refuse to mend our broken system. The fact is that it would be easy to withdraw from the EU political project and to trade and cooperate with all countries, including those in Europe, thereby returning democracy and power to our parliament and people. Only the UK Independence Party is able to force this positive change. This is another reason why I was honored and delighted to join UKIP. Quote ends from Dr. Spink. Thank you. Uh, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce to you, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, Alison West. Uh, Alison is UKIP PPC for Suffolk Coastal, and in the 2005 general election, she stood as UKIP candidate in Ipswich, where she increased UKIP's share of the vote by 68%. Well done. She currently works for Suffolk County Council, and we look forward very much to hear what Alison says this morning. Alison, thank you very much indeed. By the way, she's also married to John West, the chairman. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for attending. I would like to offer my thoughts this morning on youth crime. We all know that it has become a major problem in recent years. Not one day goes by now without a report of a murder, a stabbing, a burglary or a sexual offence, including rape, being committed by someone under 18. From January the 1st this year, 18 fatal stabbings have been committed in London alone. On the 20th of January, The Telegraph reported that the number of under 18s convicted or cautioned over violent offences has risen from 17,590 to 24,102, an increase of 37%. But the prevailing question on everyone's lips is why the offences are committed in the first place. I accessed a website, crimeinfo.org.uk, to see what it has to say on the social menace. It lists the following as, as some of the reasons why youngsters are drifting into criminal and antisocial activity. One, being male. Two, having a parent or parents who offend themselves. Three, not living with their parents or being in care. Four, suffering bereavement or family breakdown. Five, drug or alcohol misuse. Six, experiencing physical, sexual or emotional abuse and neglect. Seven, witnessing violence against a family member. Eight, playing truant or being excluded from school. Nine, associating with delinquent friends. And 10, having siblings or other family members who offend. It's a striking and perplexing list, isn't it? But I have to say, it isn't entirely accurate. There are youngsters out there who have had one or more of those experiences and have had terrible upbringings, yet they never even consider indulging in criminal acts. No. Not all offenders even meet the above criteria. I know from personal experience that some of them have had respectable, religious and even privileged upbringings, and not all are male. The latest figures show that the number of crimes committed by girls has jumped by a quarter over three years, with 59,236 crimes in 2006 and 2007. The most common offences were theft, violent attacks, criminal damage, and public order. Around 16,000 girls were found guilty of violent attacks. 
nearly 20,000 of theft and handling stolen goods, 1,000 convicted of drugs crimes, nearly 1,500 of mortaring offences, and 5,964 of public order crimes. Unfortunately, the problem is exacerbated by experts who offer their own theories. Take these two quotes from a Dr. Anne Hagel of the Nuffield Foundation. The most likely causes are to do with the way people spend their time. And another one, you now have a big period in late adolescence with big opportunities to be basically hanging out and crime can be a consequence. Well, I have to tell you, I couldn't believe my eyes when I read that one. Why should crime be a consequence? Everybody instinctively knows the difference between right and wrong. People choose how to behave. So why don't these kids make a conscious choice not to indulge in criminal and other antisocial activities? As I browsed through the net, I also picked up these tidbits. In the case of girls, hanging out with troublesome boys is responsible for their involvement in crime. So why do the girls hang around with them in the first place? According to new research, the increase in knife and gun crime in urban communities is due to the lack of police presence. But I thought it was down to a personal decision to pick their weapons up and use them. Reoffending rates for youngsters are often high because teenagers are immature, impulsive and often come from unstable backgrounds. But they still do not have to choose to reoffend. And this was the best one. Youths feel they're at war with the establishment. That one left me absolutely speechless. These theories leak into the social consciousness like rising damp up a wall. They defy logic and common sense and they cause more harm than good. Our experts, it seems, just don't have a grip on reality. They seem desperate to blame youth crime on anything but the offenders themselves. The issue has nothing to do with immaturity, how people spend their time, how they hang out, who they hang out with, or how many police are in the vicinity. It all boils down to choosing to have no respect for authority, parents, anything or anyone. Their conduct often lurches into what can only be described as vile savagery. Yet the criminal justice system treats them like naughty children. It's a soft touch and it acts as no deterrent, and these kids know it. This is reflected in the sentences that are handed out by our courts, which amount to a mere slap on the wrist. As bows are regarded as a badge of honour, persistent offenders are let off with warnings. They are sent on adventure holidays of part of their sentences and rehabilitation. This only encourages offenders to commit more crime so they can get more of these treats. But isn't it also morally wrong and unfair when we have decent law-abiding youngsters deprived of such activities? Even life for the most serious crimes can lead to less than 10 years. And as already been pointed out earlier, we have the Human Rights Act to thank for that. As a parent myself, I do not believe that this is the way to approach the problem. From what I saw of CrimeInfo.org UK, it translates as a liberal do-gooders excuse fest, designed to generate sympathy for insolent, selfish and violent youths who think they have a God-given right to take out their anger and frustration on innocent people. I may not be an expert, but I won't apologise for saying that the mindset of this website and experts like Dr. Anne Hagel are just not good enough. If my child acted like this, I would want her to be severely punished. If she was stabbed to death by a 15-year-old, theories would be the last thing I'd want to hear. The plain and brutal truth is that offering theories does not solve the problem. All it achieves is to elevate youth crime to a status of a cultural activity. We do not want theories, we need action. So what has contributed to the mess? 
Liberal government policies resulting in widespread lack of respect for authority haven't helped. They push children's rights at the expense of teaching personal responsibility. They dilute parental power by branding them abusers for smacking children who now know that they can sue their parents for assault. Schools no longer have the power to hand out corporal punishment or give detention to unruly pupils. Some parents spoil their children, substituting love and attention with possessions, and they never say no to them. A lot of children are born to teenagers who themselves haven't grown up and are incapable of giving any moral guidance. But ultimately, Parents have the biggest influence over a child's morals and its ability to, dis to distinguish between right and wrong. Children need discipline and they need guidance. The legal responsibility falls on parents to set their children a good example, to teach self-discipline, self-respect, respect for others at an early age, to stress that regardless of how badly they feel or how bored they are, there is no excuse for bad behaviour and that they must learn to express their negative motions appropriately. I'm glad to say that I can cite an example I heard of only yesterday of a parent who decided to do this. Who couldn't admire the courage of Saldinac, a mother of two from Norfolk who only recently hit the headlines? Her two sons left a man blind in one eye after what even she called a vicious, unprovoked assault. Did she make excuses for them? Did she tolerate their behaviour? No, she didn't. She did what any decent and responsible parent would have done. When she heard them bragging about the assault, she made them face the consequences of their actions. Carol said that she trembled with nerves when she reported them to the police. Despite being ostracised by her family, she has no regrets. She wanted to see justice done, so her two sons are now where they belong, in jail. Carol Shines is the epitome of what parenthood should be. She put the victims before her sons. She has moral courage. She deserves our admiration and respect. But not all parents are this responsible. And it is those ones that we need to crack down on. Measures need to be taken to confront their parenting methods. So what policies would a UKIP government implement to tackle the problem? We would include scrapping ASBOs. As has already been mentioned, a three strikes out in your option policy. We would ensure that the sentence given was the sentence served. We would scrap the Human Rights Act name and shame offenders and let schools decide whether or not to use corporal punishment. We would ensure that the police had the freedom to do their job properly and provide more youth centres and other outlets for legitimate activity. We have this problem because the kids are out of control. We have to take back the streets. The only answer is a zero tolerant approach to youth crime but we do have to be realistic. Yes, there are those who would respond to such measures, but we can't wipe the problem out entirely. There will always be a hardcore of youths who do not respond regardless of what we put in place. And for these offenders, harsher punishments, parental fines and curfews could be a start. The judicial system exists to act as the conscience of this country. Victims seek solace in courtrooms, hoping that justice will alleviate the pain and horror they have suffered at the hands of their tormentors. It is the mandatory duty of our courts and judges to administer such justice. The fact that these tormentors may be children or teenagers should not result in the dereliction of that duty. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Are there any questions from the floor?
C can you just wait for the mic, please? Thanks. Um, yeah. um, I um, would you consider something like what they used to have forestalled for the persistent offenders, the young ones, that, you know, something that try and, um, you know, lick them back into shape and make them useful citizens of them? Because I think that wouldn't work. I think the forestall needs to be brought back in some form or... Um, in the most severest cases, I think that an institution like that would be the last resort. But yes, I think we should actually use that. We have to think of every single area. We have to cover every area possible to crack down on this problem. Being soft is not working. I can just add that there is, in our policy document, there is a, an idea to bring back boot camps for serious young offenders. Again, I think we should also get rid of the hammer need for penal reform. The Race Relations Board, which has caused more race friction than, than not being there, we never had that when I was a youngster. We didn't need it. We certainly didn't need human rights. No. Human rights act is a major problem. It just gives people an excuse. Maybe even, uh, what's that, what's that uh, organisation that brought that uh, keeps any people out of shot? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's right. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, David Fraser again. Um, can I just make an observation uh, uh, on your your comment that uh, custodial sentences such as Boston will be used as a last resort for um, these persistent offenders? I mean, it is a very difficult fact to accept, I, I suppose, because it's a very unpopular, it, it sounds very draconian, but the evidence of the last 35 years tells us without any doubt that persistent offenders of whatever age, but all right, we're talking about ju juveniles now, do not respond, once they have become persistent offenders, do not respond to community um, sentences. Their reconviction rates are horrendous. And if, you, if, we, if we go down the road of creating a policy which allows persistent offenders several, several goes in the community under one form of community supervision or another, what we're doing, as the evidence shows us, is giving them a license to offend. And they will commit hundreds if not thousands of offences during, during the various times of their supervision. So I'm hoping that you, you, you get, will be able to grasp this difficult issue and show moral courage and say once a person, whatever their age, doesn't matter how young, has established themselves as a persistent offender, they must be locked up for increasing lengths of time. Because the evidence shows that that does actually um, uh, produce quite good results in deterring them from future crime, especially longer prison centres. Okay, thank you for listening. Okay, yeah, thanks. I totally agree with you on that. And obviously, first-time offenders, we have to make sure that we have every, every facility possible to ensure that they do not re-offend again. But I don't think that sending them off on adventure holidays is actually going to encourage them to behave themselves. So I think personally, that should be completely scrapped altogether. Yeah. Yeah, they work. circumstances where um, a child had committed crimes but they weren't so serious as to be put in prison. And Horstall was a kind of halfway house to prison whereby that child had a chance to reform itself, some did, some did, and to go forward. And we need to think seriously about whether our punishments are too harsh in going straight to prison, and whether we need this halfway house for some of those characters. At any one time, 
Of the top 100 companies in this country, there are something like two or three, there used to be five or six, um, who became chief executives or chairmen of those companies simply because they had turned themselves around by going through the Borstal system and being reformed. One thing I'd also like to say is that, as you will appreciate, there is a significant deficit in the numbers of people being recruited into the UK Army. Now, one of the reasons for that deficit is because there has been a political change whereby the courts will not recommend people to have an option of actually going into the forces. Um, I'm not quite sure what happens, but if you get any kind of conviction, the Army and the Navy and the Air Force will not take you. But in the past, a lot of those cases had options from magistrates and courts that they could go in and be reformed. If you like, it was a kind of services um, based form of postal. But again, it reformed those characters. So we, we, we need to think about the intermediate measures as well as the final deterrence of, of somebody actually going into jail. Well, thanks for that anyway. Thanks. Now, we've got a, a late addition to our list of speakers. He's not mentioned in the brochure. It's a chap called Michael Heaver who wishes to speak for a few minutes. He is the Eastern Region Representative for Young Independence and is the co-editor of the Young Independence Newsletter. And I understand in September he's off to the University of East Anglia. So uh, good luck with your studies, Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Heaver. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to start by thanking John West for organising this conference. Um, when I joined UKIP, I joined a political party. And I think by having this conference here today, what we're showing is that we are at the point now where we are seriously challenging the Tories, the Lib Dems and Labour, not just on the issue of Europe and the EU, but on the issue of crime, where they're badly letting the country down. Juvenile crime, from how I see it, is really quite simple. What we're looking at is young people developing an attitude that turns into a behaviour that then develops into a lifestyle. Once they've got into the lifestyle, there's no going back. We have to stop it before it gets to that point. So how do we stop it? Well, I must say, David Campbell-Bannerman and his team have done an absolutely fantastic job on the new UKIP policy paper, as been mentioned already. I'll just explain why briefly. The first point, schools play an absolutely fundamental part of our society now, I think. A lot of juvenile crime, if you look at the background of the youngsters, come from broken homes. Now, this isn't an excuse, but I think if the school played their part just a little bit more, then they would make a, quite a large difference in the attitudes of some of these young people. I'll just give you a real life example. My school, and my last year, I've left school now, I'm at college, my secondary school, during my last year, suspended six people, six times in one academic year, just in my year alone. Now, is it sensible to let these people come back again and again and again? Of course it isn't. Now, I wasn't on the, I'm not on the governor's board, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. My guess would be that they're not actually allowed to expel anyone in order to fulfill quotas at the schools. Now, this for me is just a perfect showing of how this government favour the rights of the minority over the rights of the majority who are at school to learn and get it right the first try. <laughs> But we've got to alert parents early as well, and that's in the document as well, which I was very happy to see. It's all right to say that the parents should take more responsibility, but what I don't think a lot of people realise, and I've seen this firsthand again, is that when young people go out on the streets and commit crimes, their parents aren't always aware of what their kids are up to. 
because a conviction is the way that a parent knows. But a kid can do something wrong and the parents cannot find out about it. So what we've got to do is get it to the point where the parent has to burden some of the responsibility because they have been fully credited with being notified as to the situation of their child. And just the third big one in the document for me. You know, I'll never forget it. My friend got put in uh, prison for four months, or I should say ex-friend, I'm no longer associated with him. He got put in prison for four months for a quite serious assault. And do you know what the first, first thing he said when I uh, saw him? He commented on sandwiches. He commented on the TVs. He commented on how many friends and like-minded people he met in the prison. This isn't the way it should be. We need less funding for prisons, less funding for the amenities of prisons, more funding for what the police force themselves think the money should go on, i.e. new prisons. And we need to make prisons once more a place the people do not want to go, a place the young people do not find friends and see as a soft touch. Because without doing that, we have no hope. Now, you contrast this with what the government does at the moment. Because what I've just said, we, I'm sure we could all agree, are three very sensible suggestions. But let's just contrast that with the mindset of this new Labour government. This new Labour government that's currently planning the mosquito tactic, whereby they will uh, bellow a sound out in a designated area where there are a gang of hoodlums in order to disperse them. Except all young people in the area will be able to hear it, and all young people will be affected, whether they're up to anything or not. Now, civil liberties aside, surely this underlines once more New Labour's approach to our young people. It's not a matter for them of targeting the people causing trouble. They would rather deal with the young people wholesale. And if they want to do that, then that's fine. But they will have to deal with the consequences, which is going to be increased hostility towards our police officers, who already have a very difficult job and already are very much stretched on our city streets. But this is hardly surprising, is it? If we look at one of New Labour's leading lights, Harriet Harman, a couple of months ago, she walked around her London constituency, the stab-proof vest. Now, I, I couldn't figure out which was worse. The fact that she didn't think she was going to get criticised for doing this, or the fact that many of her young constituents living in that area and elsewhere in inner city London are going to be very alarmed by these images. And as a result, maybe they will arm themselves with a weapon when they leave the house. It is no example to set. And at the same time, this woman claims that our streets are safer than they ever have been. Well, I'm sorry, I don't think that's true. I think, this, I think this goes further. I think it confirms a complete and utter disconnect by New Labour with the real people of this country, especially in our inner cities now, which are becoming absolutely disgusting, I must say, on Friday and Saturday nights when I go out. They're a war zone most of the time now. Um, they're no-go zones, let's face it. Um, but again, this is, this, uh, crime is the area where people know what's right and wrong. People know if they like New Labour's proposal to do with crime, they don't need to be educated on it. People want the police to deal with criminals and young people more harshly. That's plain. And what you could have the opportunity to do is speak very plainly and propose things that people can understand. And this is what we must do. We must get this out at a local level. We must get this out on a consistent basis. And we must show just how very, very different our outlook is compared to the three main parties. They may have all of the money. Well, Labour might not after the uh, debt collectors come after them in the next few months. But they may have all the money. <laughs> But we have the most powerful message in the world. We have a weapon in our arsenal that they will never have anymore. We have real people, we have real policies, and we are starting to have real answers. Thank you.
Thanks, Mike. Now, our next speaker is Paul Nuttall. Now, Paul is a UKIP researcher for the Independence and Democracy Group in Brussels. He is a regular contributor to UKIP's Independence magazine and is a leading UKIP activist in the north of England. He is also editor of the Bulletin from Brussels, and there's a couple of copies over there if you want one. And he is also the assistant to John Whitaker, MEP, in the European Parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Nuttall. OK, thank you very much, John, for inviting me here today. And thank you to everyone who's come along to hear us speak. Um, basically, I'm going to start by telling you exactly what I am. I'm a working class lad from a working class constituency. I'm probably, well, I'm from one of the most disadvantaged constituencies in the country, Bootle. It's a town which is riddled with crime. Recently, I was, I was uh, the victim of crime myself. I, had my, I was burgled, I had my laptop taken. And crime is the real issue, to be perfectly honest with you, why I'm in politics. And I'll tell you why. On New Year's Day 2001, we awoke our family to find out that our next door neighbor, an elderly lady of 85, had been beaten to death in her own hallway. She'd been beaten to death by a drug addict, a drug, a drug addict who then took the sum of six pounds from her house. She died for six pounds. From then on in, I've been very, very strong on crime. My branch, the South Sefton branch, also stands on a platform of zero tolerance towards crime. And the feeling that we get is that people in the inner cities, people in the old labor working class constituencies are looking for an alternative. They're fed up with crime. They don't trust Labour on crime anymore. We've got to a situation now where we're taking 38% in the local elections in one ward, 25% in another, and 19 in another. In the Bootle constituency, UKIP are the opposition to Labour. The rest fall by the wayside. Today I'm going to talk about stronger sentencing and zero tolerance. I think we've got a problem with prisons in this country because the liberal left have had its own way on this issue for too long. They've claimed the moral ground since the 1960s and since political correctness has infested our society. I want to put them down today with cold hard facts because I want to put to bed the arguments used by the liberal left regarding prison sentences and crime. I also intend to show that even though prison does work, it could work even better. However, I certainly believe before this can happen, we need to return to a society which holds common sense and individual responsibility at its centre. Okay, the Liberal left has always, they always complain that prison simply makes people worse and that re-offending rates prove this to be true. They use this argument as a reason why we shouldn't be sending people to prison and as a result, we've been lumbered with shorter and community sentences. But these arguments which are used by the Liberal left I believe collapse even under the most minuscule amount of scrutiny. Home office statistics show that the longer a criminal is locked up, the less chance there is that they'll come out and re-offend. For example, those who are released after a custodial sentence of less than a year stand around a 70% 70, 70 chance of re-offending. Yet this figure falls to 49% for those criminals who've served over a year behind bars. I would suggest that these figures not only show us that sentences, longer sentences mean less reoffending, they also show us that criminals reoffend because they aren't punished enough for the misdemeanours. To help solve this problem, I certainly believe that the Criminal Justice Act of 1991, which encourages judges to half a criminal sentence, should be ripped up. Between 1993 and 2004, the use of community sentences rose by 30%. However, statistics show that they're a failure, and the failure rate is up to 60%. Moreover, nearly 10,000 crimes have been committed by criminals who've been tagged. The logic behind community sentences is that they will allow a criminal not to become institutionalised and to remain in contact with society in general. But it's total nonsense when you consider that these criminals are continually proving that they're still a menace to society. The conclusion that we must draw is that this great labour experiment with community sentences has failed and that criminals must remain behind bars. <laughs> I 
Another mantra we always hear from the liberal left is that there are too many people in prison. This statement is usually backed up with the old canard that Britain sends more people to prison than anywhere in the civilised world. Again, the statistics don't support this claim. Britain has a, popul a prison population of over 82,000, which equates roughly to one in every 730 people in this country. It can't be denied that these figures are quite high in comparison to the rest of Europe. However, if you measure the prison population against crimes committed rather than simply against population, then those figures slightly alter. Let me explain. For every thousand crimes committed in Britain, we have a mere 13 prisoners. In comparison, the EU has an average of over 20, and the USA a huge 166. So therefore, it mightn't come as any surprise that Britain, with the lowest prison rate, has the highest crime rate of 10,000 crimes per 100,000 of the population, whilst the USA, with the highest prison rate, has the lowest crime rate of 4,400 crimes per 100 of the thousands of the population. So indeed, a criminal in Britain is now significantly less likely to be arrested and sent to prison for committing a crime today than ed in Edwardian or Victorian times. So surely the link is clear for all of us to see. The more you lock up criminals, the less crimes that will be committed. I'm sorry, folks, but prison works. Now, this point is quite close to my heart because the liberal left always claim that poverty causes crime, which seems then to exonerate the criminal from any personal responsibility. And it's then used as an excuse for not sending the perpetrator to prison. Oh, it wasn't Jack's fault that he stole the car. It wasn't John's fault that he beat poor granny over the head with a crowbar. It was society's fault. Well, there's a gaping flaw in this argument. Because if poverty causes crime, then one would expect crime to rise during periods of extreme economic hardship. I'm a historian. And most historians would agree with me that in the 20th century, the 1930s was the decade where the British poor suffered most. The Jarrow marches, the horrors of George Orwell's road to Wigan Pier spring to mind. It doesn't really compare with the widescreen TVs and the Ford Mondeos that the so-called poor today have to live with. You see, what confuses me is that crime actually fell in the 1930s. Indeed, if you compare the average prison population for England and Wales in the 1930s, which stood at 11,346, with today's massive 82,000, it's quite easy to see that something has gone seriously wrong in our society since the end of the Second World War. The only conclusion that we can draw from this is that it's criminals and not poverty that causes crime. And it's as simple as that. And the best way you stop criminals is by locking them up. Finally, the liberal left claimed that by locking up, pe locking up people doesn't work. It's only punishment. It's not rehabilitation. But again, the counter-argument can be found in history because locking up people used to work. Before the Second World War, the offending rates were markedly lower than they are today. However, since the 1960s, we've had this touchy-feely approach towards imprisonment, and it's no coincidence that crime has rocketed since then. In addition, successive prison reforms have ensured that conditions within our jails have improved, or some would say, become softer. However, all this softly, softly approach has succeeded in doing is ensuring that hardened criminals are no longer afraid to commit crime. They're no longer afa afraid to go to prison also. For example, in the name of human rights, over 60% of prisoners now have keys to their own cells. <laughs> Many now have access to computers, the internet, Sky Television, and the Lib Dems, ladies and gentlemen, yes, the Lib Dems, have even called for prisoners to have the right to vote. Well, I think there's all vote Lib Dem. It's no wonder that many come out and reoffend when prison turns out to be such a cushy number. Sanity has to prevail here, and we need to ensure that going to prison strikes a fear into any would-be criminal. Also, as a society, we need to get back to the proven fact that deterrent and punishment works. This country needs to protect its law-abiding, hard-working citizens, and the only way this can be achieved is by locking up society's criminals for longer. And whether the Liberal left like it or not, statistics prove this fact. 
We need to start promoting greater individual responsibility. We need to protect the human rights of the victim and not the criminal. And we need to ensure that punishment sufficiently fits the crime. In addition, we need tougher, a tougher prison regime and a lot more prisons, probably a doubling. Then, and only then, can Britain truly begin to tackle the crime endemic which has swept this country since the 1960s. But where do we look for inspiration? I would suggest that we look across the Atlantic Ocean and we look at the United States, specifically the city of New York. In the 1970s and 80s, New York, like London today, it was a byword for crime and urban decay. However, under the inspirational leadership of one of my political heroes, Rudy Giuliani, this trend was swiftly reversed. Giuliani realised that the New York Police Department, or the NYPD, didn't have enough manpower to deal with the city's problems. So under his leadership, the NYPD grew in size by 42%. It's slightly different in Britain because you do hear a lot of people complaining that we don't have enough police officers. But unlike early 1990s New York, it's simply not true. We've got more police per person in Britain today than ever before. The problem is that they're hamstrung by red tape, they're completely demoralised, proven by the fact that over 8,000 police officers are out on sick leave. What we need to do is we need to untie the hands of the police and let them get on with the job of policing. Giuliani was also inspired by something called the broken window theory. But in reality, the broken window theory is nothing more than common sense. It goes like this. The idea is based around the logic, really, that if one street has one broken window and that window isn't fixed, then suddenly another broken window will appear and then another broken window will appear. That could be tied to anything, whether it's muggings, or burglaries. So what Giuliani did was he began to clamp down on low-level crime such as fly tipping and graffiti through the implementation of zero tolerance policing. Police officers became proactive in their community. They no longer turned a blind eye to these so-called trivial crimes and locked up the perpetrators. As a consequence, crime in New York was cut by 69% Yes, ladies and gentlemen, 69% between 1993 and 2004. It's as simple as this. If you want to cut crime, you must start at the bottom. New York proves this example. Giuliani also increased the budget for the NYPD significantly in this period. However, what may depress you to know is that our Metropolitan Police Force still has a bigger budget than the NYPD. But whereas London's budget is squandered on racial awareness seminars and diversity schemes, Giuliani spent New York's money on increasing the number of officers and getting them out on the beat. But the problem in this country is that we don't really have a beat system anymore because it was partly abolished by our old friend Roy Jenkins during his progressive term as Home Secretary in the 1960s. As a result, what we have is a British police force, which is a reactionary force, which appears after a crime has taken place and the perpetrator is no longer to be seen. One thing is certain, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot have New York-style policing without the reintroduction of the beat system in this country. We need to get our police out of the police station, untie them with red tape, untie the red tape, and get them back on the streets catching criminals. Unfortunately, and here's the downside to this, there are a couple of problems which I think will prevent a complete New York-style policy being enforced in the UK. First, there's the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, or PACE, as it's known. PACE came about in the mid-1980s because questions were being asked about how police officers were extracting evidence from people in custody, especially after the Guildford Four and Birmingham Six debacles. Although PACE was designed to strike a fine balance between the powers of the police and the rights of the public, in reality it's a paper chase and it actually deters police officers from making arrests for low-level offences. If PACE existed in the United States, then New York would probably still be a haven of criminal behaviour. I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to have real effective zero-tolerance policing, then PACE has to be repealed. The second problem is our old friend, the Human Rights Act, which, has been, which was incorporated into British law in 1998. Now, don't get me wrong, 
I'm all for human rights, but I'm only for the human rights of the victim. I am not in support of human rights for criminals. You see, the problem Giuliani would have had is that those perpetrators of low-level crime, the ones, the small crimes, you know, graffiti, dropping litter, the crimes which actually ruin the lives of hard-working citizens, they couldn't be locked up like they did in New York because very often it would contravene their human rights. And in my, in my opinion, it leads, leaves a sour taste in my mouth. The feeling that the human rights of the criminal are well protected while those of the victim are routinely trampled on. But the Human Rights Act has also been a golden opportunity for human rights lawyers such as Sherry Booth QC, who've made a fortune out of it. Again, if you want zero tolerance, then I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, the Human Rights Act needs to be ripped up. The people who suffer most at the hands of criminals, believe it or not, are the inner city poor, the type of people I represent in my constituency. The problem is, is that they have no one to fight their corner. The fed up with Labour's lack of willpower to tackle the problem. They perceive the Lib Dems rightly as being weak on crime, and I'm afraid they'd rather self-combust than vote Tory. Therefore, the inner city is a fertile ground for a party that has both definite and strong policies on crime. I personally believe that if UKIP can get it right in this area, and I think that this crime paper is a long step in that it is a step in the right direction, that there is an opportunity to make a huge, huge impact. I also believe it wouldn't be such a bad idea to look to New York for our inspiration. So, ladies and gentlemen, to finish, stronger sentencing and zero tolerance. That should be our slogan, and under it we should strive forward, we can strive forward, stamping out crime and bringing law and order back to this great country of ours. Thank you very much. Any questions from the floor? Thank you. Yes, uh, John Croft at the front. Thank you. Gentleman at the front. Thank you, Paul. Um, a very inspiring speech. Um, where do you stand? Actually, it's John Croft, South Africa, uh, Where do you stand uh, on mandatory sentences? You know, I'm thinking about this terrible knife crime. Uh, to me, uh, uh, you know, I'm all for mandatory sentences, whether it's carrying knives or carrying guns. And I give anybody carrying a knife right now five years, whether you use it or not, because if he's carrying a knife, he's going to use it somehow, uh, somewhere. And it's a terrible state of affairs at the moment. We've read this morning in our national newspapers about these three poor children who've been knifed to death somewhere. It's a shocking state of affairs. So where do you actually stand? You know. Would you give them mandatory sentences, uh, whether it's uh, knives or, 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 or what have you? Thank you. Look, I mean, the, the, the fact is, yeah, I would. I mean, it's not rocket science. Deterrence works. If you lock people up, you know, yeah, five years, let's talk about five years. The problem is, they'll get five years and they'll do two and a half. You know, five years should mean five years. Stick people inside, make conditions in prisons worse, and you know what? When they come out, they won't do it again because they'll be scared to go back inside. It's not rocket science. You know, I come from an area which is blighted by crime. It's so much so that, I mean, if I wanted to go on, I wouldn't bother going on Friends of United. I'd just look at, look who's in court in the local paper. <laughs> I come from a society, from an area, from a community which is blighted by crime. And I tell you what, the reason why they're committing these crimes is because they're not scared of the police, they're not scared to go inside, and they'll come out and they'll do it again. Mandatory sentences, 100%. Um, well, th th this isn't my area, to be honest with you, and I I'm not sure what UKIP's line is on this area. Um, does anyone else want to answer this question? I was speaking as a, as a qualified journalist, which is um, where I started, where I finished my education, um, and 
You, see, you know, I, I agree with, with what you're saying. I think the problem is you're almost verging on state regulation of media. Um, and of course, we all, we all like the, the, the freedom of speech, notion of freedom of speech. Um, but certainly the so-called nine o'clock watershed seems to have uh, evaporated somewhat. Um, I don't know, I mean, I, I'm not really for state regulation of media, it just sounds rather communist, to be quite blunt. Um, but there is a problem, and uh, I'm sure there's working committees, working parties uh, with the media, but I do think more needs to be done, uh, because uh, this, I don't believe now, when I see my what's on the television, there is no, there's any such thing as a, a watershed at 9 o'clock. Hmm. It's gone because of the internet. Because they can download it uh, at any time now, and that's why it sort of disappeared. I read it somewhere. It's because they can download the programs at any time on the internet. So it makes it meaningless. I, I, just, I just wanted to say, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think it is a very valid point about what is said in the field of public policy. Our document, which Paul referred to, on referendum, I refer to paragraph 3.10. For controversial public issues involving law and order that are outside party politics, UKIP will allow referendum to decide the issue. In other words, if 5% of the populace in a certain area or in the country think that there shouldn't be X or Y on the TV, well, we're a party that believes in freeing the people and in listening to the people. Now, I personally, I just choose to use a great thing called the off button if I don't want to watch something. Younger people, we don't know what they're doing up in the bedroom at 10.30, watching, talking to their friend, you know, Sunita, who turns out to be a 50-year-old guy from Walsall. Now, at the end of the day, unless and until we talk to the people, if you want to have a referendum on it, then so be it. These are areas of public policy. We used to call it common sense and civility, but sadly they've died in Britain today. So we've got to be able to refer it to the people and free the people and listen to a referendum. And you give us in favour of that. That's, that's, very, that's very good, Chris, but exactly what are we going to do about Mr. Gordon Ramsay? <laughs> yes, uh, good morning. Bob Coleman from uh, Mid Bedfordshire. Um, I just take you up on a point there that. Um, you're talking about media censorship. I don't agree. I think what you're doing, you're giving some sort of uh, condition to the uh, programmes to behave in a common sense manner. I mean, certainly through my lifetime, most of the BBC, etc., was um, given a set of rules. And if you went to the cinema, cinema uh, films had uh, letters, A or 9 or 10 or something, but that's all. It seems to me that the uh, television and radio, uh, people like, uh, what's his name, Rossi, who, who seem to be able to drop the F word every three seconds, is totally beyond the bounds of reasonableness. And I think it, it makes the children of today particularly think it's acceptable. And I don't think it's right. And, and I'm not prude. I can come out with the odd swear word when I have to. But I do try to keep, limit it, I do try to keep it down to outside of family affairs, etc. But we're getting it inside our rooms in the house. It, it's not good. And I think that it's incumbent upon any government to make sure that the news media respect people's privacy in that manner. Thank you. I think what we need to do really is just take a look at um, what we uh, on our screens uh, throughout the summer, the ninth series of that dreaded Big Brother program is about to begin, and it uh, pretty much epitomises everything that uh, is uh, not right in society at the moment. Uh, and unfortunately, it's put into our televisions uh, on a nightly basis on which, whichever channel you, you choose to wish, uh, watch it on. And uh, what is really concerning is that it is majorly popular with uh, young people. and. Uh, it uh, encourages votes as well. It's the whole electoral system with this Big Brother program, and uh, the format, while successful, is rather worrying. And we, all we need to do really is take a look at that to see how poor some of uh, <coughs> the broadcasting is now. Uh, Chris, going back on your mention of referenda, 
Could I take it that it's you could policy to have this installed and therefore could it a motion be put to the next conference that you could hold a referendum on the return of capital and corporate punishment? Well, I, I, I know personally that uh, if you ask me, that, then yeah, I'm 100%. I'm, 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 I'm for capital punishment. Um, whether whether it can be put to the next conference, I mean, that's something which we'll have to ask. Well, I think you'd be better asking David Campbell Bannerman that this afternoon rather than rather than us. But. Um, but yeah, quite simply, it says here in the crime and policy paper that you know UKIP standard the criterion is that five percent of the registered electorate must sign a petition within a six-month national time limit. Now, considering that about eighty percent of people in this country would like to see a return to capital punishment, I really don't think it would be that much of a problem to get that five percent. To be perfectly honest with you, and I really don't think it would be a problem in winning that referendum. Um, so although UKIP's policy paper doesn't explicitly say that it does support capital punishment, um, I don't think it would be any problem pushing something like that through if UKIP got into power anyway, to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Bannerman, you have heard that in uh, Belgium, the lovely city of Bruges, they do allow students to go and take lodgings there on the understanding that they have a six monthly visit from the authorities. If they're found to have drugs or of any use, they are out and they do not ever go back to Bruges as students. The other thing you haven't brought up, which I have been writing to John Gunner about, is these ghastly handheld video games. I saw one at a school, it was actually the property of a, a, an Arab boy, uh, I'd never seen one before, it was a horrible thing of a man who had been chased, um, I think it was with a, a knife, now they had to try and get this man into the middle of this video, which he did eventually, and you saw this gut, a knife go into this man and the whole video just went bright red. Now, I have run, uh, written to John Gummer about these ghastly things, and now I believe there is an MP who is trying to do something about this. Um, I haven't heard yet, but... Um, every